After seven years together, she came out as a lesbian right before our wedding but what hurt most was the lies she told everyone, leaving me completely alone. My ex came out as a lesbian right before our wedding date. She then lied to everyone, and now they have all abandoned me. My ex came out as a lesbian right before our wedding date. She then lied to everyone, and now they have all abandoned me. It had been seven solid years with Dana, and from the get-go she was open about her bisexuality. She'd shared stories about her past relationships with women before we became serious, and honestly, it never bothered me. It felt good, having that kind of honesty between us right from the start. Our relationship was never about fireworks or drama, but it was more like a steady flame. Sure, we had our share of disagreements, like her habit of leaving dishes in the sink or my tendency to work late without giving a heads up. We always found our way back, talking things through over late night cups of coffee or early morning walks in the park near our apartment. The living together brought its own rhythm to our lives. We fell into comfortable routines, like how every Saturday morning we'd hit the local farmer's market, Dana beelining it to the fresh cut flowers and me always picking up an extra loaf of sourdough from the baker. Evenings often found us in our little kitchen, Dana trying out new vegan recipes she'd found online while I played taste tester, or both of us curled up on the couch, binging on our latest Netflix obsession, or deep diving into playlists of newly discovered bands. Our relationship might not have been the stuff of grand romances, but it was real. It was the small moments, the quiet understanding, the shared smiles over inside jokes that nobody else got. It was in these moments that I saw a future with her, a lifetime of these small perfect snapshots. And after seven years, it felt right to take the next step, to ask her to marry me to officially build a life together. This wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment decision, it was one built on countless little moments that told me we were right for each other. After seven years together, everything just seemed to line up perfectly. We were solid, emotionally and financially. We'd built a life together in our cozy two-bedroom apartment surrounded by plants Dana loved to care for and framed photos capturing our best moments. It felt like everything we did naturally sensed, whether it was saving up for a dream vacation or just planning our weekly meals. Ah. We were a team, and I never doubted we were on the same track. So, deciding to propose felt like the most natural next step. I wanted everything to be perfect, to reflect the thoughtfulness and depth of our relationship. It took weeks of planning, selecting the right ring, a simple yet elegant band that I knew would suit her understated style, choosing the perfect day, and orchestrating a scenario that was intimate and personal. Oh, I chose the little art gallery where we had our first date, under the guise of a new exhibit I knew she wouldn't want to miss. The gallery was small and intimate, filled with soft lighting and the gentle hum of other visitors that gave it a lively yet private feel. As we walked through, discussing various pieces, my heart pounded with a mix of nerves and excitement. At the center of the gallery, beneath her favorite painting, a vibrant abstract piece that always seemed to ignite her passion for art, I stopped. The moment felt suspended in time as I reached into my pocket, feeling the cool metal of the ring box. Ijo, brigi sarums tvi fortin pedi. I got down on one knee, and her hands flew to her mouth in surprise. Will you marry me? The words felt both monumental and terrifyingly fragile in the air between us. Her eyes, always so full of warmth and understanding, widened as she hesitated. That moment of hesitation felt like an eternity, stretching out painfully long. I could see the conflict pass through her gaze, and my heart sank a little with uncertainty. But then, softly, almost a whisper, she said, Yes. The glow of our engagement should have filled those next few days with joy and excited planning. In many ways, it did. Our friends were ecstatic, their faces lighting up as they tossed around ideas for the wedding. Beachside ceremonies, rustic barn venues, even a destination wedding in Italy. The enthusiasm was contagious, and it carried me along for a while, but something nagged at me. An undercurrent of unease that I just couldn't shake. It started with Dana's hesitation. That moment, as brief as it was, planted a seed of doubt in my mind. Why did she hesitate? I couldn't help but ask her later that evening as we lay in bed, the light from the street lamps casting soft shadows across our room. I was nervous, she said simply, her voice steady but her body tense beside me. I wanted to believe her, to write it off as pre-proposal jitters, but it felt like there was something more she wasn't saying. I pushed a little, but she shut down the conversation with a kiss and whispered, let's just enjoy this moment. So I let it go, not wanting to spoil the brief peace we had. But then there were her parents. We visited them the next day to share our news. I expected joy, or at least a warm embrace of congratulations. Instead, I was met with strained smiles and hesitant congratulations. Her father's pat on my back was a bit too forceful, and her mother's eyes darted away too quickly when our gaze met. They were acting, putting on a show of happiness, 
but their eyes didn't match their expressions. This was not the reaction I expected from the people who should have been overjoyed for their daughter. Their odd behavior only added layers to my unease. Why would they fake their happiness? What was making them hold back? The questions multiplied, swirling in my mind. I tried talking to Dana about it, pointing out how off her parents seemed. They're just surprised, that's all. They'll come around, she said, brushing it off too quickly, too easily. Our friend's reaction stood in stark contrast. They were genuinely thrilled, already diving into planning and celebrations. Their genuine excitement was a relief, but it also made the falseness of her parents' reactions even more stark and troubling. But it felt like I was living in two realities. One where our engagement was the best news ever, and another shadowed by hidden truths and half-hearted congratulations. The mixture of reactions left me feeling off balance. I was caught between the joy of our friends and the unsettling response from her parents. It should have been one of the happiest times of our lives, but instead, I found myself looking for clues, for any sign of what was really going on beneath the surface. But then, that day came. A day that seemed no different from any other. I walked through our front door after a long day at work, only instead of finding Dana in the kitchen, or curled up on the sofa with a book as I would on any other day, she was standing by the door, her posture tense, a suitcase at her feet. My heart sank at the sight. What's going on, Dana? I asked, my voice steady despite the dread beginning to curl inside me. Dana looked at me, her eyes not holding the warmth I was used to but a somber resolve instead. Listen, I know this is going to be hard for you, she started, her voice trembling slightly. But I'm not bisexual. I'm lesbian. The words hung in the air between us, heavy and cold. My parents knew this for two years, and this is why they weren't happy and were faking it. Please, I beg you do not make this difficult. Just let me leave. Don't cry. Don't beg. And don't scream. Let's just let things go like adults. She continued, her voice growing firmer with each word. I stood there frozen as she picked up her bag and walked past me, not once looking back. The front door closed with a click that echoed through the empty apartment. The silence was suffocating. I didn't move, didn't call out to her. I couldn't. The shock pinned me in place, my mind racing yet blank, unable to process the sudden void Dana left in her wake. For what felt like an eternity, I stood there, grappling with a torrent of emotions. Betrayal, confusion, heartache, each one hit me harder than the last. How could the person I loved, the person I was about to marry, keep something like this from me? Not something to see. How could she leave so suddenly, so coldly? as if our years together meant nothing. Donna, the woman I thought I knew, the woman I planned a life with, had vanished, leaving behind a stranger with her face. The realization was brutal, a sharp pain that felt both numbing and searing at the same time. As the minutes ticked by, the initial shock slowly morphed into a sense of loss. The future we had envisioned together, our shared dreams and plans, dissolved right before my eyes. Ah! Three months had crawled by since Dana left. During these months, not a single text, call, or knock on the door came. But it was as if I had vanished from the lives of those I considered close. Dana had blocked me the very day she left, and her parents, who once welcomed me into their home, didn't bother to reach out. Our friends, mutual and otherwise, remained silent. Their social media posts were filled with praise for Dana, celebrating her bravery and authenticity. Each post was a dagger, reminding me of my own isolation. My health deteriorated rapidly. Was Yunda. The stress and emotional turmoil manifested physically. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. Boing. I was hospitalized three times in those three months. Ah. Each visit was a blur of IV drips, sympathetic nurses, and doctors advising me to take it easy, as if my body's betrayal was something I could moderate with a bit of rest. The concern of the hospital staff only highlighted the indifference from those I used to call friends and family. It was a stark, painful contrast to the emptiness of my phone's notifications. Work became my only routine, the only thing that kept me anchored to some semblance of normality. I'd drag myself there in the mornings, the tasks a welcome distraction, but leaving only to return to an empty home where the quiet was suffocating. Meanwhile, Dana's journey was public, her narrative one of overcoming and authenticity. I couldn't escape it. Every time I logged online, there it was, the story of how she had finally found herself. The world praised her, admired her courage, while I became a ghost in my own life, unseen and unmissed. It wasn't just the breakup that hurt, it was the total abandonment, the erasure of my existence from the lives of those I loved. Right now, the anger seems too heavy to carry, too dense to ignite. So, I'm just floored by the disbelief, how swiftly my world turned upside down, and how everyone I thought I could lean on simply vanished. I wander through our gnome, my apartment now, it's all a painful reminder of what was and what can never be again. And it's not just the breakup. It's the total silence from everyone else. 
Not a single call or message asking if I'm okay. It's as if I cease to exist. As if my pain is less valid, less important. It's all about her. Her courage, her journey, her authenticity. You know what? Pluck them all. They showed their true colors, all right? They're all in awe of her. While I'm shattered here, ignored like I meant nothing. And pluck my ex for painting this picture. For leaving me stranded in the wake of her self-discovery. Without a second thought. I've tried to wrap my head around it. Tried to find some sliver of understanding or closure. But there's none. Just this raw, gnawing emptiness where trust and love used to live. I trusted her with my heart, my future. And our friends. I thought they were our friends. But turns out I was just a plus one. Easily uninvited when the narrative didn't need me anymore. So yeah, I'm beyond angry. I'm just. Lost. Stripped of my role in my own life story. Wondering if I ever really mattered at all. It's a hard pill to swallow. Realizing that you might have always been the expendable one. But maybe this is the wake-up call I needed. A brutal shove out of naivety. From here on out, it's about finding my footing again. Figuring out who I am when I'm not part of us. So, but as for them... They can keep their shallow concerns and their superficial celebrations. I'm done. Update. So here we go again, like in GTS and Andreas. But this time is more painful and shocking at the same time cause today and yesterday night a lot happened. Like some of you folks said, somehow one of my ex-friends saw my post on TikTok and the absolute mess started and is still going on right now. It was late in the evening, just another night of me trying to distract myself with old movies and leftover takeout. When my phone buzzed. Sorry. The screen lit up with a name I hadn't seen in months. Paul. Seeing his name made my stomach twist. After everything, what could he possibly want? I answered hesitantly. Paul? Hey! He started, his voice awkward, unsure. Unshe. I saw your post, the one where you mentioned Dana. And man, I didn't know. We didn't know. I tensed, bracing myself for what was coming. It felt like stepping back into a storm I thought had passed. Know what I managed, though I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer. Paul sighed heavily on the other end. Dana told us all a different story, he admitted. She said when she came out to you, you lost it. Tried to hurt her and then threatened her if she left. She made us promise not to reach out, told us you were dangerous. My breath caught in my throat. The accusations were like a punch to the gut. How could she say those things about me? My confusion and hurt must be palpable. Because Paul quickly added. But man, after reading your post, we pressed her on it. She broke down and admitted that she lied about everything. She was scared, she said. She said, scared of losing us as friends if we knew the truth. The room felt suddenly colder, the shadows deeper. I slumped back against the sofa, the weight of months of isolation and betrayal hitting me all at once. So you all believed her, just like that. My voice was barely a whisper, a mix of disbelief and sorrow weaving through the words. Yeah, and I can't tell you how sorry I am. We should have reached out to you, should have asked your side of things. We screwed up, big time. The silence that followed was heavy, filled with the weight of lost time and broken trust. The news that Dana had lied about such serious accusations was both a vindication and a new kind of heartbreak. Kao. Why would she do that? And why did everyone just believe her without a second thought about me? Paul's next words pulled me back from the edge of those spiraling thoughts. A bunch of us want to make it right, if you'll let us. As I hung up the phone, the screen dimmed now, the silence of the apartment felt a little less oppressive. The aftermath of Paul's call was like breaking the dam that had held back months of silence. The days following the revelation were a whirlwind of emotions and decisions. My phone, once a reminder of isolation, was now incessantly active with messages of regret and apologies from friends who had deserted me based on Dana's lies. Wama. See. Among these messages was one from Dana herself, begging for forgiveness and admitting her deceit had been driven by fear of losing her friends. It was a lot to process. The apologies from friends and Dana's confession, each unfolding in the glow of my phone screen in the dimly lit corners of my once shared apartment. Then came the unexpected message from Mary, Dana's current girlfriend, who was blindsided by the whole situation. Her apology was mixed with confusion and hurt. She had known Dana for a year yet had only heard of me as a roommate. This detail stung sharply. It was disorienting to grasp just how extensively Dana had rewritten our shared past to fit her new narrative. The gravity of the deceit weighed heavily on me, and in a moment fueled by a mixture of hurt and the desire for some control over the chaos, I decided to confront the whole situation head-on. I created a new group chat, including Dana, Mary, Paul, and the rest of my friends who had been misled. The digital room felt charged with tension, 
a virtual stand-in for the confrontation that needed to happen. In the group, I laid it all out plainly. I'm not changing my mind about forgiving what happened, not yet. I started. The words stark against the backdrop of their previous silence. I've even considered legal action against Dana for defamation. I added, my statement partly true. The idea of suing her had flickered in my thoughts. Not fully formed, but a reflection of the deep hurt. And the drastic measures I felt pushed towards. I continued, if you all truly cared about me, wouldn't at least one of you have reached out to confirm the story? To ask my side. My words were not just a question but a mirror, reflecting back their own actions, or lack thereof. And then I shared more about Dana that I had kept private, details that painted a fuller picture of the deceit. With each message sent, I felt a small release, a venting of months of pent-up frustration and sadness. After ensuring my peace was heard, I blocked them all. It was a drastic step, but necessary for me to start healing, to cut out the voices that had so easily believed the worst in me. The last few weeks have felt like being stuck in a relentless storm. No matter how many numbers I block, new texts and calls flood in, friends or who I thought were friends, are now strangers reaching out through different numbers, their words swinging between apologies and accusations, and even involving people I don't know to pass their messages. But it's relentless and exhausting. Every buzz of my phone spikes my anxiety, turning what was once a simple ringtone into a trigger. It's unreal, the extent of this chaos. I keep telling myself this has to be some twisted nightmare that no one actually lives through this kind of drama. But every new message, every unknown caller ID flashing on my phone screen, drags me back to the harsh reality that this is indeed my life now. It's all true and there's no waking up from it. Today I saw a therapist. I sat in a quiet, softly lit room that felt a million miles away from the turmoil of my life. It was supposed to be just about dealing with Dana's betrayal and the fallout with my friends, but it turned into so much more. Once I started talking, Old wounds opened up. Wounds I hadn't even admitted were there. The deaths of my parents and my sister, events that I had boxed up and stored deep within, surfaced with overwhelming force. I cried. Not just a few tears, but deep heaving sobs that shook my whole body. I cried for everything that's happened, for everything I lost, and for the first time in a long while, I didn't feel alone with my pain. The therapist listened, her presence calm and accepting a stark contrast to the judgment and betrayal I'd become accustomed to. Leaving her office, I felt drained but strangely lighter. It's clear to me now that this is just the beginning of a long journey. A journey to heal not just from the recent betrayals, but also from the grief I've carried for years, buried under layers of daily survival and distraction. I forgot to write this little part, but the quick resume is that I never had a good relationship with Dana's parents. So we never went along well because they always said that I wasn't the right guy for their daughter so I never cared about them. But this time, they asked me to think wisely and to not sue Dana because she was afraid, and they even justified her actions. That's all, and in fact, I wasn't surprised about their reaction to the news of marrying her. A month has passed since my first post, and here I'm again. I know that I promised to be here again when things would be better, and I hoped for that very much, but unfortunately my life isn't better at all, and things are always going worse than I expected. I'm gonna talk like I talk with my therapist cuz, a little bit you all are like my therapist lol. Every session with the therapist peels back layers I didn't even know were there. I entered therapy with a the hope, maybe naive, that a few sessions would set me right, that I'd find a way to quickly navigate they with or the emotional wreckage Dana left behind. But it's turning out to be more complex, more grueling than I'd ever imagined. I find myself sitting in the same soft chair each week, the room always quiet, except for the subtle ticking of the clock and the occasional sounds of the city that drift through the window. These sessions are my safe space, yet they challenge me deeply. As I talk through my days and recount the events that have unfolded, I realize how much I've bottled up, not just recently but over years. Decades even, I've started to cry. A lot. It's not just a tear or two, but a profound, shaking type of crying that comes from a place deep inside. I cry for my parents, who I lost too soon, and my little sister, whose laughter I can still hear if I let the silence linger long enough. I cry for what happened with Dana, how her deception cut so deep and for my friends who turned their backs when I needed them the most, treating me like an afterthought, not the person they had known for years. The therapist listens, her notes quiet, her nods encouraging, but the work is mine to do. Each session, each revelation, it feels like I'm trying to climb out of a deep well, the walls damp and mossy, my hands slipping every time I think I've found a new hold. It's frustrating and sometimes, I leave feeling worse than when I entered. But there's also a glimmer of hope, and understanding that this is a process, and it's supposed to be hard. When you're unpacking a lot of buried emotions, she tells me, 
her voice always steady. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. Healing isn't linear. These words have become a mantra for me on the hardest days. I know I'm not an expert at any of this. I can't neatly dissect my feelings or predict how long it will take to feel whole again. It's a journey without a clear map, filled with unexpected turns and setbacks. But I'm learning. About grief, about betrayal, about the strength it takes to rebuild trust, not just in others, but in myself. This isn't the quick fix I hoped for. It's slower, messier, more painful. Yet I cling to the moments of clarity, the small victories when I can talk about my sister without a breakdown, or when I can reflect on Dana's actions without feeling that deep, dark anger. After losing my parents, and then my little sister, the world seemed to shrink down to a pinpoint of grief that was almost unbearable. When Dana came into my life, it was like a breath of fresh air sweeping through a long sealed room. She became my focus, my future, someone to build a new kind of family with, a chance to start over and create a life filled with the happiness and stability I had lost so suddenly. I poured everything into our relationship, every dinner cooked, Every date night planned, every small surprise was a brick in the foundation of the new life I envisioned for us. I wanted her to feel loved, not just ordinarily loved, but deeply cherished. I made sure to listen to her dreams, support her ambitions, and be there whenever she needed someone to lean on. Dana wasn't just my partner, she was my confidant, the one person who really knew every facet of me, my vulnerabilities, my deepest fears, and my hopes. In my heart, Dana filled a space that had been hollowed out by loss. She was my soft spot the person whose happiness became synonymous with my own. Over the years, this bond only deepened, rooted in countless shared moments and private jokes, the kind that weave two lives inseparably together. But what perhaps wasn't clear in everything I've shared before is the depth of my commitment to her. Every plan for the future, every dream about what lay ahead included her. She wasn't just part of my life, she was central to every part of my vision for the future. This is why the betrayal cut so deeply, why it felt not just like a personal loss, but like losing a part of myself. When she left, it wasn't just a partner walking out the door. It was as if she took away the very essence of the family I had tried to rebuild. When he da, I had ist, I had tried to rebuild. Komiad, Bailey, Oshi, Dorimian, Bazosnigas Po. The promise of a new life, a new beginning that had once seemed so bright and certain, crumbled into uncertainty and disillusionment. Now left in the wake of her departure, I grapple not only with the pain of her betrayal, but with the reality of being alone again, confronted with the echoes of past losses. It's a strange, hollow feeling to realize that the person you trusted with your deepest self, the person you believed would never hurt you, was the one who left the deepest cut. But a journey to heal from this isn't just about moving past a broken relationship, it's about reconstructing my sense of trust and understanding what family and love mean to me now. Coming back from the army was like stepping into a different world. After years of structured days, where the stakes were life and death, the transition to civilian life felt disorienting, quiet and mundane. I was carrying more than just my duffel bag home. I had memories and traumas tucked away, the kind that don't just fade with time or can be left at the doorstep. It was during this turbulent phase of readjustment that I met Dana. She entered my life when the echoes of my military service were still loud in my mind. A time when I was trying to find who I was outside of a uniform, she saw past the facophagate I presented to the world, the decorated veteran with medals and a straight posture. Dana saw the vulnerabilities, the night terrors, the silent moments of reflection that consumed me. And rather than turning away, she stepped closer, choosing to understand and share the burden of my hidden battles. It was love at first sight, not just in the romantic sense but in a profound, life-altering way. Uh -huh. Dana represented hope, a beacon in the fog of my transition. Her presence brought a sense of normalcy and peace that had eluded me since my return. I was enchanted, not just by her beauty but by her compassion and unwavering support. So yes, perhaps it was naive, but I believed in the fairy tale she represented. Dana was the one for me, the person who could make the concept of home feel real again, not just a place, but a state of being. In her I saw the potential to rebuild the family I had lost to create a future filled with laughter and love, a stark contrast to the solitude and solemnity of my past. That belief in our future was what fueled every decision, every sacrifice. I poured all of my hopes into our relationship, trusting that this was the path to a new beginning, to a life where the shadows of war and loss would be replaced by shared happiness and mutual growth. Each moment with her reinforced this dream, building up an image of what could be if we continued to walk this path together. I, reflecting on the past year, 
I've come to realize that life doesn't always unfold as planned, and sometimes the most painful experiences carry the most profound lessons. Living through the whirlwind of betrayal, abandonment, and the subsequent journey of self-discovery has taught me more than any single moment of happiness ever could.